Hello, uh, my name is Jennifer Chenoweth and I curate the Oakwood Cemetery Chapel in Austin, Texas. And in doing so, it's very important to me to understand who all is buried at Oakwood Cemetery and in Austin Municipal Cemeteries. And I rely heavily on research provided by people um, who have been working on this for years, decades, thousands of hours before me. And then I help take that information and uh, also work with Kay Boyd, who's part of this conversation, to uh, research biographies of those people and understand the impact of their lives in the culture and history of Austin, Texas. So I'm delighted to be here with Robert Tiemann and Kay Boyd, who are members of the Austin Genealogical Society. And I believe, Robert, are you a member of Save Austin Cemeteries as well, or just yes. a volunteer? No, I think uh, at one time I was a life member, but I'm not sure what I am anymore, but I still get all the emails and everything. He's a friend. <laughs> Lifetime honorary member should be an appropriate title. Kay has been doing uh, research. I know Kay a little bit better, but I'm very curious to hear more of the backstory of how she got interested in this project. Um, I know she has family members buried in and is it in both Oakwood Cemetery and the Annex or just the Annex? Okay. No, Oakwood, the Annex, and Austin Memorial Park. Right. So I would love to hear, uh, Kay Boyd is on the board of Save Austin Cemeteries and has been a, a big researcher and contributing member of that organization. And um, the City of Austin and Parks and Recreation staff have relied heavily on both of your research in order to um, create authenticated records and databases of burials and understand the monuments and where they are and the mapping of the cemeteries, really important information. So that's kind of the background of our conversation. And I've been really excited to learn from Robert Tiemann and Kay Boyd what project they undertook, but really the first inklings of why. why. Why did you care about this project? You might not have envisioned it to be as big as it turned out to be when you began on it, but what captured your interest about documenting Austin's cemeteries? Uh, I'll start off and the KU jump in. That's fine. Uh, actually, I got started in this because of work Kay was doing. We had Kay and uh, several other people in the Austin Genealogical Society were doing cemetery surveys. And I was, at the time, I was pretty gung-ho on the genealogy. Uh, unfortunately, I, my interest has waned a little bit in the last couple of years, but uh, I was interested in, in doing just general uh, cemetery research because I've got ancestors scattered across the country uh, in, uh, in uh, Mississippi and in various counties in the state of Texas. And so I was doing some research for my own family history in doing that. As far as Oakwood is concerned, I have, I have ancestors on my mother's side both in the original Oakwood and the Annex. Uh, so I had a, also had an interest in that particular cemetery doing that. But it mainly was because of working with Kay and wanting to work with Kay uh, that, and Jean Schroer, Schroer, who used to, the late Jean Schroer, who was in the Austin Genealogical Society. She was heavily involved in cemeteries too. So between those two ladies and my own interests, I got interested in, in doing something at Oakwood. Does that jive with your remembrance, Kay? Yes, I think both of ours, we got started because of the genealogy. And I think genealogy just draws you to cemeteries because there's so much to see, so many stories to learn and putting things together that you didn't know, maybe you didn't even know the people were connected, but they're buried near each other. So I think that's probably how the cemetery in general got started. Um, and then 
the Genealogy Society undertook organizing some of the information that had been done before it, it hadn't been documented. You could find a report in the history center and it would say, so-and-so went out to a cemetery and saw this. Well, you didn't know where the cemetery was and you didn't know when they went. So we just tried to bring up to date some of the information that was already there. When I, when I started this, this project, I think I sort of started by myself. And I realized right quick that this was a huge undertaking and we don't need a lot of help. Well, who better to help me than Kay? And of course, Kay was volunteering for everything that came along in those days if it had to do with genealogy. Let me say something about the motivation for working on Oakwood. Besides having family there, uh, the records on Oakwood were sort of scattered and incomplete. And there had been several attempts by others to do a survey of the cemetery and record everybody that was there. But uh, there was a, a number of errors there. And I have to say there's probably some errors in our work, but there were a number of errors there. And so we thought that it, I thought it'd be a good idea to start afresh. Originally, I intended to compare what we saw on the ground with the plots that were on record with Intercare. Intercare at the time was responsible for maintenance and care of the cemetery. And they had an office out at Memorial Park and they retained some uh, books out there that had drawings of every lot in Oakwood. Well, I'll take that back. They didn't have drawings of every lot and that was the problem. The records were sort of scattered and incomplete and there were lots missing. And so my first intention of looking for, make sure we got everybody that was buried on that lot covered I realized that was going to be a Herculean task. And in order to get something done, I dropped that idea of trying to fill in the blanks. If there wasn't a headstone, there could be people buried there, but I wasn't going to try to uh, bring the two uh, resources together. So that's how I ended up deciding just gravestones. We had enough problems with the gravestones. Uh, like Kay said, we'd go out there morning or evening. Sometimes we had to pick a time of day to go out there so the sun would be shining on the face of the stones so we would be able to read them. Uh, we didn't do anything to scrub off or clean the stones. We just did the best we could in trying to read them. And there are a number of stones that were face down there are a number of stones out there that don't give any identifying information other than our son or our daughter or our beloved wife. And so you could sort of tie those together to the family that was buried there, but you didn't know exactly the name and the dates that went to that particular person. Uh, in some of the older parts of the cemetery, we found many broken stones. We found many stones that were face down. And unfortunately, they were too heavy to pick up to see what was inscribed on the face of the stone. So we had to leave those things sort of like they were. But I think between Kay's doggedness and my following along, we were able to accomplished quite a bit out there in recording the gravestones. What I don't know, Bob, and maybe they, Jennifer wants to know too, is what, did you use the books at Intercare for your, I know we had something where we compared the names because yeah. usually uh, you found, and that's what, I don't know how you did that. Yeah, I, I, I dug out my, uh, my file box of all of our, I've got every one of your notes from your 
field trip there, Kay. I could recognize your handwriting. Uh, to start out, you know, there was a publication, was his name Smith? Yeah, Paul Smith. Paul Smith had done a publication. And I think, uh, and that was a public document. And I think what I did, I think I scanned those documents to make us a starting point. Now, somewhere along in there, we got involved in, in the map. You know, you're curious a little bit about the map. You know, there were, that uh, cemetery had been drawn up in pen and ink way back there, but all of the copies of it, they only had some a few copies of it, and those copies were dog-eared and torn and what have you. So in my engineering work, I had done a lot of AutoCAD work, so I said, well, I'll just, I'll just make AutoCAD copies of those maps. They were a map for each of the four sections in the hospital, in the cemetery. So I prepared that too for us to follow as a guide. Oh. Excuse me. So along with the, the worksheets that I had from Paul Smith's book, we also had uh, reduced size drawings of each section of the cemetery so we could tie the lot number down to, to the people that were, or gravestones that we were recording. As a final result of all of that, uh, I have, you know, authorized the use of those data files, not only the for the book, but also the maps. And, you know, I've turned that completely over to you folks that were working on that big Oakwood survey and and subsequent work to that. So hopefully it's it's still a usable tool and uh, it can be uh, expanded or embellished however you might find fit. We worked, uh, Kay and I worked on that cemetery for quite a while in the wintertime and summertime and all kinds of weather. What years were those? Well, the book was published in 2006, so mm -hmm. I guess we did our work from somewhere in the early 2000s. Uh, I might have some dates on some of the information that I have, but uh, uh, I would, for now, I just say it'd be adequate to say that we probably, we probably were working on that for over oh, two years, I would say. Yeah. One of the most interesting things that's that I saw in the cemetery while looking at some of these uh, gravestones is over along the fence on the west side of the cemetery, uh, the northwest side. There were two gravestones there for people, and it was they were inscribed that they had perished in the 1914 flood. And that piqued my interest, and I started going down to Austin Public Library to the, and did some research on that. And there was a heck of a flood on Shoal Creek in 1914 and washed out many buildings. You know, most of us, Kay and I, remember the 1981 flow on Shoal Creek, but uh, the, the 1914 flood was even bigger. It even swept streetcars off of the rail so it was quite a flood but anyhow that was I think that was one of the most interesting things that I saw I came across in our survey. I think cemeteries still do that they give you they raise your curiosity and you go I, I need to know more about this story I need to know how this happened and who and um that's my philosophy. Everybody has a story, you know, whether they just died of old age or whether something dreadful happened or, and as you say, that, that stone has even been included in one of our MMM tours. What happened? Good. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, some of the inscriptions on the stones were, were unique. I remember one uh, gravestone that for this male person, this male, 
and, and it was inscribed on there, he loved his mother. And I always thought that was a fantastic uh, inscription to put on a stone. I'm sure his mother was pleased. <laughs> Likely so. So Robert, did you and Kay do this work after you had retired from being an engineer? And can you tell us about that? What, what was your career in engineering? And then when did this project take off for you? Well, uh, I was, uh, worked as a structural engineer for buildings. I worked for a large architectural engineering firm in Austin. It was called Page Sutherland Page at the time. It's gone through <laughs> a, a variation of names. And in fact, uh, Charlie Page is a member of the uh, Cemetery Association there. We sort of go back and forth sometimes on who can claim credit for certain buildings that were done in Austin. But anyhow, uh, uh, that's when I, when I was really interested in it. So it was always a part-time uh, vocation to be in doing some genealogy. And I've collected tons of, of data from the field, but have never gotten around to doing more than write just a few short stories to include in the uh, AGS journal uh, and the like. But uh, so I was working until 1994. Uh, he, he was still mentoring people when we were working because I remember he would say, oh, I need to go meet so-and-so at 10 o'clock. And I'd say, I thought you were retired. Well, I am, but I'm mentoring so-and-so. So, well, when I he, did he had retire, a hard time giving up. <laughs> when I did retire, I, I did go in back and mentor in some young engineers with another firm. And I did that for about four or five years. And then I finally decided I needed to do something else, which has mostly been nothing. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, but I have done a lot of traveling around the country and some foreign travel. In fact, I, my, my daughter, Nancy, that was helping me set this up a while ago is the uh, the one family member I've got here that actually went over to Germany and went to the location of our ancestors' home in Germany, actually found it, took a few pictures of it. There were uh, stones that we ran across that were in German, someone Swedish. The Hebrew stones had a hard time deciphering those. Uh, Spanish. We thought Danny could help us, and Danny said, no, I don't read Spanish. And we went, okay, Danny, we're lost then. So, uh, But there are several languages that are included in all the stones that are out there. There's probably some Italian, but I can't think of any that there were lots I ran of across. Italians. Uh, my uh, team and ancestors lived in East Austin, my, my great great grandfather was a railroad engineer, and so they lived out close to the to the uh, what was called the roundhouse, which was a, a storage place for all the locomotives. <laughs> and that area was a very mixed uh, ethnic area out there. It was sort of on the edge of the black and brown neighborhoods, but the Anglos that were there, they were Germans, they were Italians, they were Swedish people, they were all kinds of people out there. So it was a real mixture of people out in that neighborhood. Do you remember uh, where in East Austin? Uh, on 3rd, 4th, 5th Streets? My grandma, my great-grandfather lived at uh, on 4th Street at the head of Chalmers Avenue. I went out there a couple of years ago, and it's the whole place out there is covered with three and four story apartment buildings. So there's not a thing left there to remind me of that old neighborhood. But in that neighborhood out there, there were names like Peroni, uh, uh, Franzetti, uh, you know, Italian type names. There were a lot. It was quite a mixing bowl out there. 
didn't you yourself live on fifth or sixth? I uh, with with my uh, my father and mother separated when I was about ten years old, and so I lived with my mother and my bro older brother, and we lived a lot of times in my mother's mother's house, my grandmother's house. She was a Gruner. And she married a Parker. She married that Scots, Scotsman Parker. And uh, uh, so we lived on 6th Street in a big mansion type structure, which is long gone. And uh, then we later moved down on 2nd Street, 2000, uh, 2009 East 2nd Street, and lived in a house there. That house is still there but it's in very poor shape. Uh, so my early years were spent at Met School. Uh, that school is gone, but a new building is in its place. Well, they're so gonna I, do I, away I, with the new one too. Yeah, I spent uh, up until my mother remarried in about 1948. I lived out there in that part of East Austin. I was, uh, when I go to Austin High School reunions, there were always four or five of us guys would get together because we, we were raised in that part of town and we talked about all the good times we had uh, playing ball on the school grounds or going down to the river and going fishing and hunting and all kinds of uh, neighborhood mischief like that. There was a big field down close to where my grandmother lived on 4th Street. Mm -hmm. uh, this was before the Austin Housing Authority built Chalmers Court. Chalmers Court yep. was not there when uh, I was out there, but it was later built. And it provided a good place for some of us kids to go roller skating because it was only sidewalks, only concrete sidewalks in that part of town. But there was this big open field there close to the Wolf residence. And I still believe there's a big That's house still there, house. yeah. But that big open field is where the circus would set up. So it was a habit for my mother and I to wake up early the day that the circus train came to town and we'd walk down to Water Street, which was where the circus train would unload and the uh, uh, wagons, the circus wagons were towed over to the circus site by elephants or horses or what have you. So we'd go down there before daylight the train would arrive four or five o'clock in the morning. We'd go down there and watch them unload and then go down and watch them erect all the tents and what have you. In yeah. fact, I worked one time on a labor crew down there uh, putting some of the tents up. So Water Street has some memories too. So, Kay, in your ancestor, when you were learning about your own genealogy, which of your ancestors were interesting to you? Or another way to ask that question is, what got you interested in researching your genealogy? I've always done it. I, re I remember when I was 12 years old talking to mother about it. And um, we grew up with grandparents and uh, big families, especially on the Swedish side. So it was just unnatural to find out more or to prove that what was written down was correct. And um, the other side of my family came from the South and I've been over that way looking at cemeteries and libraries. So um, it's just something I've always done. Who inspired you in your um, heritage to keep you on the hunt for more information? Like, did you have a particular family member who you may have known while they were living or had learned about that got you excited about this or kept um, you motivated? 
No, I do. I have several families that are well documented, and not, so I don't care about them. They're already done. So I would take off on my daddy's main line and work on it just because it was so hard to find anything. And then mother's line was the Swedish line, and it just always fascinated me. Um, so I have taken it back to the 1700s on most of the branches of her line. Uh, and there's not very many people left. So I, I share all my research with uh, cousins and other living relatives that are still around, which aren't very many. But um, it was always fun to share my findings with my mother. And she'd say, I didn't know that. And I went, yes, mother, you knew it. You just hadn't thought about it in 50 or 60 years. So. So when you met at the Austin Genealogical Society, I'm sure the project you ended up doing was much bigger than what you set out to do. What was it? What was the project that you set out to do and why? I guess to document all the cemeteries in the county was what we were trying to do. Uh, and it hasn't been completed because we still find little places that were overgrown or hard to get to. And uh, people will ask me what, even now, there's not very many because most people just go on and find a grave or whatever the easy part is and look there and don't really care about going out and doing field work. Um, you know, I think um, that's that we'd like to stress is that we started genealogy before the Re, uh, abundance of information on the internet. Right. Uh, we both spent many an hour down at the Texas State Library twisting the knob on a microfilm reader or a microfish reader, you know, searching for information on our family. And that was drudgery work, uh, but it was always so exciting to find something. And uh, nowadays, uh, I don't think some of the younger genealogists appreciate the fact that they've got so much of this information available to them on the internet. And it's people like Kay who have put that kind of information on the internet, so. That was part of my goal when I, besides the Oakwood project, was just to go down and transcribe a lot of what, with like the Sexton records and things that we use now, is just to make them available to people. And even I went through the old um, Austin genealogy publications and uh, digitized some of those and put them online because people didn't have access to the things that were published 50 years ago, but there were a lot of active ladies that did a whole lot of work back then. Um, so my goal was just to put the information out there, I think. So about how many cemeteries did you survey in the field, Kay? Well, I can think of five out in the county and then the city cemeteries. I didn't help with plumbers, but I helped with the others. And then the Austin Genealogical Society, um, how many did they do overall with all the volunteers? Gee, I think it's supposed to be 250 county cemeteries. I think I read that someplace. I don't remember for sure. Robert, which cemeteries did you help inventory monuments for? Well, the only one I really worked on was Oakwood. Our publication got out. I had a couple of inquiries from people that wanted to know something about some uh, <clears throat> people that were buried at the annex. And so I'd go over and do a little, you know, looking around trying to find something for them. This was before Robert Sage finished the work that he did over there. Uh, but uh, uh, that's that's the only one I, that I did. Like I said earlier, I had visited a lot of cemeteries where my ancestors were buried at different places. And, and in fact, my original uh, 
ancestors that came to Texas in 1846 from Germany. I don't know where they are. You know, the, we, we think they're buried in this one cemetery down around Fayette County, but there's no, there's no record. But one other thing I want to mention before I forget it, the, the book that Kay and I did, uh, the Austin Genealogical Society sponsored me getting extra copies of that book made up. And we actually sent a copy to the, the Austin Library, the Family History Library in Salt Lake, the Clayton Library in Houston, the Dallas Public Library, the Texas State Library has a copy, and Allen County Library in uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana. So we, we, we did, through the generosity of the Aid America, Austin Genealogical Society, we got copies of that book spread out. And Jennifer, Bob mentioned uh, the annex while ago, going over and finding, I'm sure you've realized that death certificates and newspaper articles just refer to the annex as Oakwood. So people get all confused. Well, what do you mean? It says no. And even today, I don't think they clarify that it's the other part, the other cemetery. It's not the old cemetery. And as you probably know, Jennifer, we because we've done all this work going around all these lots and gravestones, <laughs> we've seen a lot of the situations where there's been a lot of negligence and and wear and tear and maintenance operations that need to be done in the cemeteries. Uh, I know we've both been disheartened at time when we would go out there and we see things in such a disrepair. But uh, Dale Flat, who is a member of the Genealogical Society and who we are both friends with, uh, has led a program to try to get all that taken care of. And things have been a lot improved since, since the times that we were doing our surveys. And uh, uh, it's, you know, the situation was that most of the people and families that have people buried in old Oakwood are no longer around and they don't look after the cemetery. So they fall into disrepair and lack of maintenance. Uh, it's been real disheartening to, to see some of the conditions that some of those lots and some of those uh, stones are in out there. So Robert, on any day you were out uh, surveying the monuments either by yourself or with Kay, did you come across any big surprises like things on monuments or animals or people or um, events or activities that surprised you? And another question is like, what was the most fun you had or, or, or talking to Kay out uh, looking at the monuments to, to, and discovering each other or history together? So what, can you tell us a few of the experiences you had out actually walking around the cemeteries and documenting those either by yourself or with Kay? Well, recently I was out there. I think I sent Kay a picture of this. Uh, uh, my Great grandfather Parker, he has a big lot that all of his family and two or three generations are buried on, is out near the hog lot. And I was out there one day just stopping by to see if the monuments were still upright. They got some massive monuments there, uh, not real tall, but massive in size. Uh, and I noticed over by the hog. Uh, what there was a fox sitting on top of a of a headstone over there, and I managed to get a picture of him, and uh, uh, I thought that was unique. The two uh, stones that I uh, told you about earlier about the people that perished in the 1914 flood that was interesting. All of the cute little sayings <clears throat> that you see. 
uh, on some of the stones was very interesting. And of course, I always liked the the tall monuments of, with, that had statues on them, winged statues. And it was interesting to, you know, to see some of the local customs that were used on some of the graves, you know, with shells on them or stones on them or uh, resting on them and what have you. Uh, and, and also being an old Austinite, it was always interesting to come across a, 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 a grave of a family that you knew in some, you know, minor way, but it just brought back some memories uh, of those people. Uh, the uh, Southern family that uh, was the, uh, one of the founding partners of that architectural engineering firm I worked for. He, he and his wife was a, a, a Reed, like of J.R. Reed. Or something. She was the daughter of J.R. Reed. And so it was interesting over in the annex to see the the big lot they have over there with the reeds and the Sutherlands buried on it. You know, there were some of the people that I worked with and knew in my professional life. And there's some there's some odd there's some odd gravestones out there, and many of them have been pictured in some of the publications that have been done on on Oakwood. Kay, do you remember any particular times out at the cemetery with Robert? Not really. We pretty much worked individually. I mean, we might pass in the, you know, say I'm quitting for the day or did you, you know, but he would take a row or a section and I would take a row or, you know, we, we did separate work so we could accomplish more. Uh, but I guess we referred talked about something maybe we did I don't it was so long ago I don't remember anything special well we handed off you know information back and forth you know you would provide you, me information. yeah you took it and entered everything or putting it in the in the database yeah and then I'd provide you with some new right. information to go search out <laughs> We used to, before it was cleaned up so much, there were homeless out there everywhere. There was a place over in the old grounds where the jasmine grew up. And I remember walking by and there was this guy and I scared the squat out of me. And then over there where the wall is around the Doyle, there was a guy that lived in there. So, and I don't, the foxes, I don't remember that far back, but, uh, there's always birds of all kinds. If you hear them blue jay squawking, they've got an owl in the tree or something that's going on. Yeah, you know, doing this survey, we learned, at least I learned which roads you could drive down. You know, some of those roads are pretty narrow. And uh, as my uh, mother explained to me one time that that was because those wagons, those hearses, hearses, the way they were built, they could turn a very sharp corner in a very limited amount of space. So as I would go out there to do surveys and search for graves and what have you, uh, I would uh, know which ones I could make a turn on if I had to turn. Another interesting sort of family-like situation, uh, one of the daughters of my great-grandfather uh, in later years lived in a uh, woman's home called I think it was Alton 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 Altenheim I think Altenheim. and I found that lot where there are a number of people buried there that that lot is marked as has a marker calling it Alton so what do your families think about all of this time you spent and all of these hours, Kay, you spend researching genealogy and family histories? 
don't understand it at all. <laughs> Why do you want to do that? Well, you're still doing it, girl. Well, yeah, not very much. Sometime back, I decided it was time to take my kids and grandkids out to the various cemeteries in Austin where, where our ancestors lived. Uh, my uh, my ex-wife and I arranged a meeting to have all of our family members, sons, daughters, wives, children, go out to first Austin Memorial Park. We met out there and we pointed out the graves over there of my ex-wife's family side. And then also my brother and sister-in-law are buried there. So we went there. <clears throat> we went over to Mount Calvary, which is a Catholic cemetery, and took them in there. And we all looked there. And we sort of gave a little history of the people and that were buried there. And then we went to the Oakwood to where the Parkers are buried. And also the Grunerts, which was the other German grandmother that my mother's mother is buried. And then we went over to the annex where my mother and my sister and uh, who died when she was about eight years old is buried along with my Parker grandparents. So uh, it was very interesting to take those kids over there and they asked questions and they were really interested in it. So I, I think that was a, an effort, you know, worthwhile effort there to, to try to introduce them to that. And part of why I did that was I was going to try to find out, okay, now who's got to be the one that's interested in carrying this on? <laughs> I think my youngest daughter, Nancy, might be the be the one that might do that because she's very curious about things like that. But I don't, I'm not sure the others are too much interested. I've got a room in my townhouse here that is full of these storage boxes of genealogical information as well as family photos. And I tell them I'm leaving that all to them to straighten out. I've been throwing it all away during this time of not being able to go out and do much of anything. So I'm cleaning off my bookshelves and my research folders. And I thought, if I don't do it, my kids are going to have to do it. So thank you very, very much for your time sharing your stories and but really, thank you for all the hours and hours and legwork and research and time you put into it. Because I know these passion projects, if you knew how much time it would take to do it when you set out, you would never commit to doing it. But once you get started, then you feel obliged to finish. And you realize that's important and nobody is going to do this work if you don't start and carry the torch. So I really appreciate you doing all this legwork. And I hope I... Um, I hope my staff's work continuing it on uh, makes you proud. And if we can do a better job, you let us know. All right. Well, I've so got long. a lot of your a lot of your work in my computer that I refer to every now and then. And I'm always interested in the work that y'all have done on Oakwood. Thank you. It's been amazing. It's story needs to be told. Indeed. Well, thank you, Kay. It's good seeing you again, girl. Okay, dog. I know I never see you at AGS because when I go, you don't go, and, and I haven't been <laughs> lately. now nobody goes, so. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Okay, bye. Bye. Bye, Jennifer. Thanks a bye. lot. Bye.